an. Ja, meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen. Ähm, darf ich Sie endlich begrüßen nach einer sehr langen Zeit. Wir haben eben schon gesprochen, es ist äh, nahezu drei Jahre her, dass wir das letzte Mal so eine Art Veranstaltung gemacht haben. Ja. Danach ging ewig nichts mehr. Und umso schöner, dass wir uns jetzt alle wieder in Präsenz die, treffen können. Das war die letzte Woche vom, vom Lockdown damals. Die Italiener durften schon nicht mehr kommen. Ne? Und eine Woche später war schon alles dicht. Genau. Wir haben es gerade noch hingekriegt. Wir haben es gerade noch hingekriegt, ja. Aber umso ja. mehr äh, freue ich mich, dass, Sie, dass ich Sie herzlich begrüßen kann zum Rollout des Forums Explore to Innovate und im Rahmen ähm, der großen Eröffnungsfeier des IFM. Mein Name ist Boris Weltermann. Ich äh, moderiere normalerweise die Nachrichten bei Allgäu TV. Deswegen bin ich auch technisch nicht so im Stoff wie Herr Schick zum Beispiel. Der wird mich da tatkräftig unterstützen. Er ist aber bei unseren Probandenstudien meistens dabei. Also so ganz fachkundig ist er nicht. Ja. <lacht> genau. Ähm, herzlich willkommen auch dir. Schön, dass wir das mal wieder machen können. Ja, genau. Auch von meiner Seite herzlich willkommen. Mein Name ist Bernhard Schick. Ich bin Institutsleiter am Institut für Fahrrad. Uh, Director of the Institute for Driver Assistance and Connected Mobility. And together with my colleague Rolf Jung, I don't know where he is, we together basically are heading the Institute. And well, it's great to have you here so that you can get insights into our innovations and our technology. Yeah, it'll be a very exciting in the afternoon. So what is basically the Explore to Innovate? What was your motivation? Explore to Innovate basically is intended to enable research and technology to be experienced in touch basically, so a part and to contribute basically to transfer of knowledge and technology because technology basically needs to arrive with the people and the industry. So this is a core task and this is what we want to achieve with this forum. And this event in particular lives from a unique experience which is to really touch and experience things. Well, what is transfer of technology and knowledge? Well, as I said, research doesn't mean only we're in the ivory tower and trying to think of problems that may occur. We want to solve problems of the industry. This is a key motivation for us. So therefore, the bridge to the industry is very important. We have great companies here with the Explore to Innovate Forum. So very good corporations is what we have with them. They cover different areas. And when you walk through this building, through three floors basically, you see great exhibitions of uh, state-of-the-art technology and also you will see results of what we have researched on. Okay, so you make knowledge from money and money from knowledge. Yes, research basically means that you make money out of innovation, basically. So just um, openly speaking. And basically the result, the goal is to have it in the industry. Explore to Innovate covers two days. Today and tomorrow there will be a tech experience day. What is the difference between those two? Well, today there is the rollout and of course it should be a bit more experience. So you should be able to relax, also to listen. You have the opportunity to take part in a tour. You can just imagine it just like a museum's tour, where you have a guided tour through the three floors in order to experience the different stations. And tomorrow there's the hardcore expert day. So to discuss the latest technology with experts, we have many, many live demos. So thank you very much, Xavier for uh, allowing us to have the test track in use. We have live demos on the test circuit. We have test demos in the simulator and also um, upstairs. And we are also very proud that many companies have come and will come. Audi, Audi Sports, for example, BMW, Volkswagen, Volkswagen Brazil, Thomas Kersten from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, warm welcome. Porsche, Porsche Motorsports, Mercedes, AMG, Hyundai, Mazda, Fendt, Apt, Mahindra, aus Mahindra Indian, from India and Iveco. So we have great suppliers just like Continental. So a very, very co close cooperation. Svoboda, Carriot, um, Magma, and last but not least, TÜV, Süd, Dekra, and KUS. They are also represented. But we also have different development suppliers and also suppliers for development tools that 
just enable us uh, to develop. It sounds like an interesting day and evening. So you, the museum tour, basically, basically, it's the first museum where you see things that do not exist yet, right? <laughs> well, you're right, you're right, yes. Okay, then let's just state some organizational things. Well, one thing I have to say, so you saw that over there at Conti, there was also a party. Well, don't get a wrong impression. So we also work, right? So it's not only party. So please don't get me wrong, right? Okay, we start with the keynote session just in a second. Afterwards, we welcome an, a particular guest, a special guest from sports. We also have breaks, of course. And then there will be an opening of the technology exhibition over all floors. And at 5.15, there will be a, this, uh, a panel talking about virtualization. Then we also have tours of the technology, technology exhibition, research facilities, will be a very big um, tour and then of course there will be dinner and a buffet of course and just feel free to help yourself from the buffet. Yes, you will have received headsets so for this museum's tour there is a channel for simultaneous interpretation. Well, this event is live streamed. Algo TV has a English and a German live stream um, broadcasted. So a warm welcome to all those in front of the screen. So just for you to know. Yes, that there are also some others that listen and watch. Then at 8.30, there's a second panel discussion talking on test efficiency. And if you have questions, there are always employees around that answer question or just ask us. So I would like to get to the first speaker, first of all. So first of all, I would like to welcome the president of the um, Kempton University of Applied Sciences, Dr. Wolfgang Hauke. I don't know which one you can use. <laughs> Studying in the Alga region. Region. Act professionally and enjoy the Alps. Ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to be able to welcome you here with Hello everyone. So today we celebrate a bit late the opening of the Institute for Driving Assistant and Connected Mobility, IFM, in the framework of this new format that has been introduced, which is Explore to Innovate. So I have a list of welcomes. That I just go through it very quickly. It may be the case that the one or the other person is not here, just like as Mr. Schick mentioned. First of all, I would like to welcome the State Minister Markus Blume. Well, he will not be here live, but he will have a video message for us. A warm welcome also and to Mr. Alexander Holt, Vice President of the Bavarian Government. I would like to welcome the member of the German Parliament, Stefan Strake, then Mr. Alex Eder, the first and Lord Mayor of Memmingerberg, Mr. Alvin Lichtensteiger, the first Mayor of Havangen, Mr. Ulrich Ommer. And my special wishes and greetings go to Mr. Uwe Reisenricht, who is the point of contact in the Ministry of Science. He's always been a strong support and he's been accompanying the IFM from scratch. 
and he is very open and positively open towards new ideas, but I will talk about that later on, talking about new ideas, and most of the time new ideas mean financials. <laughs> All of you, all of you that I mentioned, you document with you being here, your interest um, for our IFM. And I would like to welcome Dr. Sascha Semmler from Continental, who will also be a keynote speaker later on, and Mr. Xaver Fackler by Fact Group or from Fact Group. And I would also like to welcome all those members from Fact Motion. I don't know whether it's Fact Group or Fact Motion, but a warm welcome to you. And also a warm welcome to the person responsible for the technology transfer, Vice President of the University of Applied Science, Mr. Rupp, and the Director of the Institute, Professor Dr. Bernard Schick. And I would also like to welcome all those colleagues that represent the IFM of the University of Applied Sciences and that also support our institute. The vision of our University is competence through network diversity. And I think this institute here is an ideal embodiment of this vision and is also lived such. The basic thought behind this vision and mission is being convinced that this conviction that performance can only come from productive cooperation of different actors and players. Let me just name some examples for the IFM and give you um, a clearer view. At the IFM, we have colleagues that do research and work coming from different areas, IT, informatics, um, machine engineering and others. There are corporations with different companies and Mr. Schick, you read out a list of corporation partners that also work in the area of the institute. Teaching is also very important. We have two courses of studies, which is a bachelor course of vehicle engineering and also driving assistance as a ma course of a master course. And those are integrated in the A-Drive Living Lab and also society is part of this for example, open research days, and I think this took place one week before the first lockdown. So society is also informed and included. And I think all those points show that this vision at this point, but also in other areas of the University of Applied Sciences, are embodied to a very high degree. I actually thought that I have a something in front of me, a table, something like that, but never mind. All the points that I mentioned lead to the fact that the University of Applied Science is a driving force, a driving motor in the area. And also the task of transfer is ideally covered with the IFM. The rooms here, how the layout is, etc. And this is what you will see when you go through the rooms. And also the connected circuit, the entire atmosphere you can feel here seems to be just positive. And it is positive for creativity and a research spirit. Young people, so the future bearers and carriers of competence Competence, different nationalities, they cooperate and work together on highly technological topics that will be shown and presented in the next two days in the framework of this um, forum. Had I known this space at the beginning of my um, course of study, I think I would have become an informatics or an engineer. Everything is supported by the financial help of our ministry. Thanks for that. 
in die Verstetigung des Instituts kommen, As we get into a new area of this institute, I would like to express my hope that the successful activity of the IFM will be considered in the budget of the state budget of the next years. Well, note on the side, Mr. Rappenlist, the application for the extension and also um, the consolidation of the institute will be forwarded to the ministry, just by the way. The success of the IFM is based on the very nice situation and also win-win situation which always Aber is a good cooperation. But it is also Menschen, based on the motivation of young people that we attract wurde. and want to enthuse as the University of Applied Sciences. So therefore, please allow me to make a note on the side. So the new university um, law, so this law, is now in a second draft phase, so we have it on our tables, and it will be put into force just in the next couple of time in the state parliament. And one point is the promotion right for different areas of the University of Applied Sciences. And only with this opportunity it will be possible to have effective in impetus and incentives to have a good implementation of transfer of knowledge and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, this event is supposed to convince you that we have a very strong research facility which, on the other hand, also influences teaching in many areas. I hope that all participants have a very great and experiencing um, event. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Hauke. And let me just get on stage so that you can see me as well, not only hear me. So let's now listen to State Minister Markus Blum. He will not be here in persona, but with a video message. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues from the Parliament, I would like to extend my best wishes and greetings to you on the occasion of the opening of the Institute for Driver Assistance and Network Mobility in Benningen. Things are moving forward in the Allgäu. Uh, it's not even two weeks ago that I was allowed to open a technology transfer center here, and now, so to speak, the second strike. What both projects have in common is that uh, we have been on the starting line for a longer period of time, but we can only celebrate now. 2018 founded, they moved into the new building in 2020. 2021, they luckily got the keys and organized the keys transfer. Now in 2022, finally, also, they can show officially what they've achieved here. Even though they haven't started properly yet, at least they didn't have their opening ceremony, they already have written a success story with highly innovative things, dynamic driving simulators, that only exist in the Allgäu, for instance. And I would say this is exactly where, with the high-tech agenda in Bavaria, we set new impulses and new foci. The high-tech agenda Bavaria, which uh, the president, which Mr. President comes on top in your case, has made sure that our high school, our University of Applied Sciences drives innovation here. 47 uh, new jobs, 57 new jobs, including 24 professorships, plus almost 27 million euros in funding. I can only tell you uh, we are lying an important foundation stone said that cutting edge research will continue to be possible and even more so in all parts of the state. I find the development at your university particularly impressive. And what I said two weeks ago, I can gladly repeat here once again. We are kind of creating an Algoi Valley, which can definitely hold a candle when it comes to a comparison um, with the other valleys in the world, the other big valleys in the world. I can only wish you a lot of joy and a lot of success. 
uh, with everything that you have in terms of new development possibilities. The free state of Bavaria is by your side with 10 million euros in the first five years. And what is being created here right now will definitely be supported and supported um, and fostered by us. I can only tell you make the best out of it and don't forget to say thank you. Thank you to those who contributed in a special way for this institute to be created. Lots of supporters, lots of fosterers, lots of friends of the University for Applied Sciences in Kempton and two political colleagues that I definitely want to mention because it, this project has always been very important for them. That is the parliamentary group chairman Thomas Kreutzer and the local minister of state Klaus Holicek. And now a good start, a dynamic start or a dynamic continuance. Have a nice day, good luck and see you soon. Yeah, and we will continue dynamically, um, that is the uh, greetings of Xaver Fackler, the owner of Fuck Group. Hello. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen. I would also like to welcome everybody here in our house, the Fucked Emotion, here in the Innovation Park, or we call it the Innovation Park. You can only see the finished products out there, but um, I would like to show you today how do you get to have such a testing uh, space, such an Innovation Park. I've got a couple of slides for that. I prepared a couple of slides for that that I would like to show to you. And that should illustrate how something like that comes into being. My career actually started with TÜV Süd um, as a TÜV tester there. And then I decided, um, I mean, I come out of this area here. I decided that I wanted to go back home, actually, and build something here. And you always try to do what you can do, and that is testing vehicles. So I started, I, I found that FACT, um, the name FACT uh, was supposed to be a polar opposite to TÜV. Um, and nowadays, uh, the name FACT is also very well known all across the world. We're one of the, the well-named technical services, technical um, labs. We're accredited with various different authorizing um, bodies. We've got our own measuring means and instruments. And from the overall vehicle to the individual components or systems, uh, we um, do authorities. We are represented in Asia. We're represented in Spain with our own lab, uh, with our own labs or our uh, own lab spaces Italy in southern Europe, in Italy, in Switzerland. And on top of that, we also have the innovation park here um, of Fact Motion here. Fact in Motion. I founded Fact in 1996. Uh, Nowadays, the Fact Group has about 200 staff, 200 employees and experts. And I founded Fact Motion in 2012. And that was basically due to a coincidence. I was flying over this area here and I said, this is it. This is really it. I always had the vision, basically, uh, to contribute to the mobility of the future with my own means. And so we started here. We started um, on this conversion area here, which is under the leadership nowadays of the, the municipal um, industrial park Benning and Harbangen. And I would like to show you what something like this uh, looks like when you, when you start with something like that. Okay. So I called that from conversion area to high-tech uh, location. And this is what it looked like when I flew over the area here. Is there also a laser? Okay. As you can see here, you can see the conversion area. Nowadays, um, I wouldn't have a chance in hell to get about 30 hectares of space uh, all connected with each other every hectare. And as you can see here, there were still the ammunition dumps here. There were three uh, nuclear bomb-proof hangars here. And apart from that, there were barracks there. There were the Americans there still. They had their nuclear bombs here. And then on the way, uh, they, they drove them to the hangars where the fighter planes uh, were. And 
then I took a photo of what uh, the situation is like today. So that's exactly the same space. And as you can see that a lot of stuff has changed. Um, so we all had to build uh, the areas that you can see here right now. This area right now, or the innovation park, um, is headed by Moritz Hess. I think Moritz is here too, isn't he? Moritz, thank you very much to you for everything. And as you can see, uh, we have we built this innovation park here. We've got the large multifunctional area, break uh, runs, uh, noise runs, and so on and so forth. All the necessary testing areas. Here a bit of more of a close-up view to show you what we've built here. From the brake tracks to multifunctional areas with 3.2 hectares, bad road stretch, the inclination hill, and also the noise measuring uh, tracks. We've got four of them all together, one in Spain, one in Switzerland, and also uh, who has their own motorway. That's another thing that I wanted to show to you. Who has their own motorway that's 1,005 meters long here on the right hand side in the image and that's where we're doing a lot of TÜV tests as well or type tests that you can run in these in these areas and it was actually my goal I mean I had Silicon Valley somewhere in the in the back uh, of my mind and I called it Silicon Hill here so that we um, created um, a central testing site and that this is the anchor point, and that here in this anchor point, companies uh, start growing. And my intention, my vision seems to be working. You can see that today. The first highlight was when Continental signed their cooperation contract in 2016. And once again, I would like to say thank you very much for that. And Continental um, are building a development center for 150 people directly here, here in this area. So, as uh, the second company, um, the Fakt GmbH, came here with one of the most modern exhaust gas centers, mobility centers, that is that building uh, up the road here, just up the road from here, exhaust gas, uh, emission measurings take place here. We also do um, yeah, measurings for e vehicles, for energy consumption. The next step was also a huge uh, highlight that was EGF. I would also like to say thank you very much. Um, to, no, IFM, sorry, that was IFM. I would also like to say thank you very much for that, Mr. President. You were involved in that as well, and I would like to say thank you to Mr. Schmidt. And then uh, we continue uh, like that. Um, M Dynamics came here. Then in our innovation park, which uh, we put into operation in 2020, there was no space left anymore. That's full. Now, um, that starts with Piech, uh, development of the automobile, then company uh, Zod X, uh, Certex for cybersecurity, a cybersecurity partner. As you all know, that when you have uh, type approvals uh, of vehicles, cybersecurity is also a big issue. That is also something that is going to be tested. So we needed a good partner for that. First floor on the right hand side, Fact uh, Endurance. That is one of the offshoots of my company as well where we also do vehicle testings all across Europe, where we collect data um, for autonomous driving all across Europe. We've got about 50 people employed there. And on top of that, uh, we still have some uh, space free um, in this building. That's always very important for companies that they can expand. There are various different areas, also in the area of Benningen, of the municipality of Benningen, a couple of uh, areas where we can still expand here. So it has always been uh, my goal to cater to the needs of our customers out of one um, hand. We're a certifying center. We can certify companies according to ISO, all the uh, approvals that they need. We can do the e-mobility in our own house, emissions. Um, as I said, we've got the ADAS here with our testing uh, space here. We've got our own institutions here as well. Then type approvals here, obviously, conformity approvals um, and 
also the exhaust, the Federal Institute for Exhaust Gas um, gives us lots of orders. Then functional safety, we've got Certix um, as a partner for functional safety as well, who also do our trainings and our audits. And then we've got alternative drive systems. We, we, yeah, they always try to be very innovative and are always at the forefront of innovation at alternative uh, Antriebe. And all that belongs to the FACT group. Uh, it's, it's obviously nice that they're all here. Um, and we've um, created a great vehicle. Um, we have the ESP um, authorities and tests, and we can use our partners for that. And in that, we are very strong to get all out of one hand. So what will the FACT group do in future? Next, um, the way it looks here, we will have uh, one of the most modern EMV centers here for lorries, for buses, and for airplanes. We've got the airport right next door, so we're very privileged here um, with a test bed here because the new vehicles have to be tested under full load and so we're in the midst of doing this this is what is going to happen here then we've got the hydrogen systems as well we don't see that here but there is a hole over there where the hydrogen tanks are being tested right now and uh, that's going to be uh, something very important for the future of lorries. We've got all uh, the equipment for that. If compressed hydrogen, if liquid hydrogen, we can test all that. Then we've got a huge uh, dyno, a brake dyno. It's already here. And then the brake dust emission measuring is also going to come. So it's not only uh, the, the fine dust and particles of exhaust gas, but also from brake uh, dust. There are new uh, rules and regulations, and in future also wear and tear on tires and the materials from the tires. So we're always at the forefront of mobility, and I think a lot is going to happen here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fackler. Uh, that opens your eyes, you know, all kinds of things that you don't see from the outside, so that's great. The next speaker you already know is Bernard Schick. There you go.
So. Das waren ein paar Impressionen right, von so uns. Da. Those were some da impressions of our work, basically it's just uh, brand new, basically. We're um, just producing them. So um, that shall give you some insights in into the activities gesagt, and the people that do. So in order to infuse people for research, this is a motto of us, and the close connection with the industry is supposed to be a reality check. So it's not basically a one-man show. With some professors that work, we have approximately 100 scientific staff and research assistants. So they work in four research groups. So we have the research group A-Drive, Safety, Sense and Connect. Additionally, we have different research teams where we have bigger research groups, for example, human factors, vehicle testing, simulation, AI, so data science and artificial intelligence and software and function. You will get some impressions when you walk through the different floors. And all those colleagues work on the topics of the future. We really have a unique research environment, so thank you uh, thanks to the ministry, thanks to all those that actively helped us and supported us. We also got the freedom to have modern um, workplaces, workspaces, everyone has his or her locker. And you then just choose the workspace you need for this particular task, so new groups can be created as well. We also work in think tanks with the industry. We have project rooms where we have representatives of the industry for weeks sometimes, and we have someone here for the next 10 months that is supposed to help transfer knowledge. And this is one of our main tasks. And what helps us very, very much is the test circuit. So just open the doors and out. So we are also in a safe and secure area. So we can also have unregistered vehicles to go to the test track. We also have Audi and BMW cars that were given to us for tests. We have a very great and huge fleet. And we also have different bus um, connections so that we can also realize things that we want to realize. Well, we also work in areas and topics just like connected technologies and that is always a fireworks of technology. So it's always about environment sensors. That's the reason why we have continental. We have artificial intelligence, environment models. We have a cooperation with Porsche where we can have an AI-based vehicle be driven. Um, we also have a shadow mode that learns from the driver. And if the driver drives differently than the system, there is a retraining taking place. So Johan is here, he can also show something as well. We have different sensor simulations, virtual validation, etc. So it's a huge fireworks, but last but not least, you should did not forget the human in the center. And I would like to show you a short video of that. I don't know why the video is not starting, but probably... Can I do it myself? Good morning, Harry. Good morning, Harry. Good morning, Eric. Yes, yes, good morning. Let's go. What is your destination today, Eric? Destination is work, just like every day. Go, go, start driving. Would you prefer the standard way? No, I prefer you take me through China. China is 15,000 miles from here. Loading what? maps and alternative language. No, no, abort, abort. Aborting trip to work. What is your destination today, Eric? Because I am begging you, just take me to work. Engaging climate control system. No, 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 enough with the climate control. Just drive. Sensing nerves level rising. Activating relaxation music. No, I just want to drive. It might be your last chance to drive. Unfollow me, Julia. I shall be slain. Eric. Eric. Also, der Video zeigt das, denke ich. I think the video good. shows it quite. Um, well, es geht immer noch um selber fahren. it's das still about driving yourself. So automatic driving is becoming increasingly important for the future. Uh, but mobility 
is supposed to be fun as well. So also, not only driving yourself, driving pleasure while driving yourself, but also being on the passenger seat. So the emotional connection between human being and machine will hopefully maintain. Probably just like a horse rider and its horse. The needs are very important for us. So it just needs just like safety, security, recognition, status, self-realization, and individuality. Everyone knows it knows the Maslow pyramid knows where the terms come from and this is also part of our core research topic so how do people experience the driving so that they also buy it recommend it etc so it's not the case that you probably have a system three times for example when you try it um, at the dealer then when you show it to your neighbors and then when you sell it so Basically, systems are tested three times in a life cycle, basically. But a system which is not used is useless. So acceptance is very important. And for us, we have different attributes that come out. So basically, the question is, how do people experience the driving experience? And how do we get everything into a harmony? And of course, my teaching topic, which is driving characteristics, is very important and necessary for this. So there may be different moments, basically, but those comfort, experiencing comfort and a comfortable ride is becoming more and more important. So those are important topics. We also take care of the development process. So how do we make development process much more efficient and better? Of course, through virtualization. Okay, let me just check whether I can manage to see it. Here we see a video or a visualization just like one you can see in our simulator, same technology in the background here, we have used much more ray tracing. Here we can see Tokyo, so you can see photorealistic images that are actually virtualized through sensor models. Ganz wichtige Themen. And those are Und very um, important topics. And last but not least, what is very important wie wir dann is what you can see in the video. Meaning, how can we close the gap between the virtualization and the test per se? Because virtualization leads to a um, estrangement because the customer experiences uh, driving differently than testers, basically. So we need to have an instance where we can make different experiences or different tools experienceable, either for decision makers or something like that, or to invite testers to do a reality check whether everything is right and everything is as it has to be, just as we, the engineers, think so. And we're working on a new model, and I can show you one example. One example on where we work and drive on a highly virtualized um, driving path, where we scan 5 millimeters. So the Trunkelsberg round, which is 36 kilometers, this is what we digitized. But we can't basically drive it today, but I will I promise you that you can drive the Trunkelsberg um, circuit next year. But what it means is what I can show you with that video.
So einige von Ihnen haben die, wenn die Möglichkeit Some of haben, you will have the opportunity fahren, to drive the simulator. I think we have 12 slots. slots. So they will be ja, given out uh, in a draw, basically. So we have one here. Genau, ansonsten wollen wir Ihnen Einblicke gewähren von dem, was wir tun. Except for that, we want to give you an insight of what we do. Thanks for the attention. I would like to hand over to Boris again. Bei mir geht's auch relativ schnell. Well, die Mobilität I will der Zukunft. be quick. Darum so, mobility of the future, this is what we will be talking about today, and this is the topic of Dr. Sascha Semmler from Continental. Life. Life doesn't happen in one place. It happens everywhere. That's why we move. Going places we've never been. Going back to where we belong. Chasing life. No matter what your heart beats for, our heart beats for taking you there. Today, as it has for 150 years. 150 years of shaping mobility Fulfilling dreams, thinking ahead. Remember? We remember every moment. No matter what your heart beats for, our heart beats for protecting lives. For getting you there safely. For cleaner air with our technologies for the next generation so they can go wherever their hearts take them Ladies and gentlemen, Herr Professor Hauke, Herr Professor Schick, Professor, Hauke, Professor Herr Schick, Schick Dank, Mr. Fackler, thank you very much for giving me the occasion to be here today in order to show the contribution that Continental makes to mobility and particularly to autonomous mobility that um, yeah, we're going to contribute in future to. In this respect, I would like to start directly with my first slide, um, which shows what the motivation in all this is. What are the visions, or what was the motivation for us? It says here, Continental's Vision Zero. Don't um, misunderstand that with zero vision. Zero vision means no vision. That's not what we mean. But the Vision Zero means that in the future, we will have a world where dead, injured, and accidents will be a thing of the past. And uh, this contribution does not only start with autonomous driving, automated driving, but it started much earlier. That is, with the use of airbags, where it became possible for the first time that people could survive serious crashes. Then we go on to ABS ESE. That's where I grew up uh, with driving dynamics at the TU Darmstadt and Frankfurt, where we are in a position to stabilize the vehicle in such a way that the wheels don't block anymore, that the vehicle can be controlled by the driver of the car in critical situations situations in snow and ice and in so far an extremely important element that we're talking about here. The logical consistency, the logical consequence of that is to give the car eyes in the form of radar, cameras, lidar, with uh, the purpose on the one hand obviously to increase safety. That means if there is a vehicle in front of us and we measure the distance via radar that we can uh, have an influence in critical situations but also to relieve the burden uh, of the driver from standard situations, ACC, automated, uh, that automated following one vehicle in, in the motorway, on the motorway. Also when you drive out of your lane, uh, for instance, and you get a warning that we're in a position to support the driver in such a way that the vehicle in critical situations, when the driver's deviation is um, attention is deviated, uh, we can keep the vehicle under control. And the logical consequence is what we realize here. That means we've got a strong background in the area of safety, airbags, ABS, ESP, camera systems. And the next step in that direction in future will be that we don't have to drive at all anymore unless we want to. 
And this is an image uh, of the Vision 2030, or, 2030 or what it could look like, the world of tomorrow, which already exists in part today. That means we've got vehicles here that drive autonomously, shuttles these cubes. You might talk about whether they're beautiful or not, but they fulfill a great purpose. Autonomously, you can get people from A to B, but it's not only about persons, it's all about services as well and goods that need to be driven from A to B by trucks up here, for instance since they can also drive autonomously. And that has a great significance even today because we don't have so many drivers that are available nowadays anymore to get all the goods and services from A to B anymore. Um, so we also have to contribute to a relief of the burden here. Up to the topic of drones, I saw that in your video, Professor Schick as well, this whole taking a different look at this whole topic of mobility, land, air, and sea, so to speak. And the following video should show you a little starting point for all that. This is um, how my day could have started, actually. Um, it actually started with coffee. I look different, uh, obviously, from her. But at the end of the day, in the future, uh, in the mobility, I get my phone which knows um, pretty much exactly where I have to go in the morning. Automatically, automatic, my vehicle uh, exits the garage. Uh, I don't even have to go into the garage. It comes out automated, radar, camera systems, lidars, ultrasound equipped. And then it's also a very safe um, exercise. Then the next step uh, is to, to press a button. I drive to Benning in here to the test center. And up until um, a certain distance, as long as it's uh, rural roads or something, you press a button and then the car drives autonomously. And that is um, yeah, something that Daimler have already realized to a certain extent. They have reached a level three system already. And that offers further possibilities in terms of how you can shape your drive, how you can shape your day on the whole, always assuming that we uh, are still moved from A to B and do not everything uh, via Teams and Zoom meetings only. What's also important here is that we have the sensorics, uh, the respective sensorics on board. That means if it's only a camera or a radar, that is not uh, so much insufficient. And when people die, that would be critical in so far as sensor suite, radar, camera, leader, forward looking in order to also have safety anchors so that the system does not only work uh, when we have nice, beautiful weather with beautiful sunshine. Actually, it's better to have slightly cloudy um, conditions. That's the best uh, conditions, but also in bad weather situations, uh, rain, snow, ice, and so on. That means in this example here, the uh, step, here we are. We've got these two steps already. Uh, we've already gone through that. Uh, we're talking level three now, uh, where the driver is taken out of responsibility to an extent in order to be able to, to do other things at the end of the day. And the whole thing goes on like that. Let's imagine we drive into the city. At some stage, we want to park the vehicle automated. And at some stage, a shuttle should also pick me up and should get me to my ultimate goal. This is what we see here. Now the vehicle drives into the parking space automated. I don't even have to look into the washing or charging of the vehicle or anything. But what's also important via my phone, I already said so earlier on, that I want to get from A to B with a couple of further information points. So now my shuttle comes that's already reserved. I can enter the shuttle. And this shuttle then takes me wherever I need to go. Press again. Here we are. Maybe also uh, in between, in order to realize something like that, what are the elements that we've just seen? On the one hand, uh, in order to realize level three systems or cubes, the uh, number of sensors and the, the, the computing capacity that you need has increased manifold, obviously. That doesn't mean that we should go this step tomorrow, but it's important that on the one hand, we move on with assistance systems in order to prevent accidents, but then also with increased content, with further content, we can uh, reach 
reshape the usage of vehicles. That means uh, further technology players that come on board, but also completely new business models, where it's not only about buying a car, I want to buy a car, but I want to have mobility service, mobility as a service. So that takes us to a new dimension to an extent. And that was also the, the topic uh, that we had with Thomas Wilde, holistic systems. It's not only about having a car, it's about having a solution, a solution that takes me from A to B. And those are those are huge changes, obviously, that we all feel, and in, in that sense also positive changes, and that mean for us at Continental, um, that, that also applies to OEMs and T1s, that the product portfolio that we have, that the business models that we have will radically change, obviously. That we also have uh, completely new players in the market here that we didn't even think about uh, at the beginning. Be it, for instance, co companies such as NVIDIA, they are very strong in graphics, for instance, but now um, also contribute to artificial intelligence being integrated into products. And then the key element from my point of view is this whole topic of partnerships. Um, partnerships of companies, of universities, pro public-private partnerships, partnerships with cities, so real ecosystems that is realized here. And in particular, we also have these topics tier one and tier two that are not so important then anymore. At the end of the day, you have to have a connected system of strong partners and to realize then and process these these topics. And how we take it from there then, uh, topic seamless mobility, we've arrived at the company or at the meeting, but then there are further features that we can also realize, I already showed that, there are the self-driving trucks, um, we've got the drones, we've got EV tolls, flying taxis in the future for certain clienteles, but also robots, um, for instance here, there are enough test cases here already in the world that uh, take uh, goods um, last mile delivery to the customers or in that case uh, yeah a good is deposited here so this whole topic of mobility is not only what we know from the car but it goes far beyond that actually and what is really important here is apart from the sensors in the car is the infrastructure that plays a significant role in the cities and therefore also this topic public private partnerships and then obviously services that you can realize now finally the package has arrived so everybody is satisfied and you can unpack it in the evening and so far i'm particularly glad to be here professor schick because uh, this whole um, connection of universities, uh, of universities of applied sciences, of companies, of cities. All that is, um, from my point of view, um, these are the original conditions in order to realize products and solutions um, yeah, for tomorrow, because one company, we've seen that um, in the past, we saw that, that one company is strong in a certain field, you know, but all the topics that we face in this autonomous um, driving landscape, they're so strong, you have to do that together in associations, and therefore, I'm really glad to be here today for this opening event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll take that from you. And now I can uh, actually um, ask today's uh, star guests, uh, bronze, silver, and gold. These are colors that count something in sports. He knows all of them, and he's also from the Algoy region. Ladies and gentlemen, Johannes Rützek. Is one of the most beautiful moments when you just let go of everything. The jump just releases you and then you have the feeling of freedom. And then this month-long training is just put into the seconds of jumping and when you're in the air, it's just total and complete silence. Every detail is important, so preparation on how you get the jump, and then in the air, how every muscle, the muscle tension, and nevertheless, you have to try to be relaxed. Well, luckily, I started cross-country skiing 
just as a pole. It's always about your inner fear just to find your limits, find your boundaries and go beyond them. There are situations where you just want to give everything, where you have to perceive because it's important, although it's very hard. But you know, at home, I don't like to be a one-man show. Great to have you here. Well, we could see it in the movie, in this film, so the change or the switch between cross-country skiing and ski jumping is it important. Yes, for me, it is important. And I think that's the reason why I decided to become a Nordic combined skier. I was fascinated from by ski jumping, you know, in Oberstdorf. You know, and you hear it from my dialect. So you have just the ski jump um, at, at the doorstep. So just as a child, I started to do cross-country skiing, and I also saw it in the youth competition. You know, there was something good. And of course, you always have to learn something new, of course. And that's the reason why it's part and parcel of everything. And this interconnection, just as you can see it, one thing is a type of sports, a sports of precision, where every detail is important. Of course, details are important and technique as well. And of course, technique is also important in cross-country skiing. But at a certain point in time, you just have to switch off your brain and your mind and then just go beyond your limits. We're well, not only coming from Oberstdorf, but you also have a different connection to the university. You were a student here. Yes, in 2020, I did a bachelor's degrees in economic engineering after a very long, long course of studies. And Kempton actually offered me this opportunity. So in winter, every weekend, I'm on tour. So from Thursday to Monday, and a presence course of study when I started in 2013, 2014, you know, it was very difficult. In summer, though, I focused next to my training that we do now as well. I focused on the course of studies and I planned it such that I spent more than one semester there and I managed it to finalize it in almost seven years. Where well, you were sporty, you're very sporty and you actually achieved something which only few achieve. So how important is it to have your second you know, uh, opportunity, your second job, basically? This was the decision, basically, to do this study back then. Of course, I was successful back then, but not to a degree that I have today. So I'm very thankful and grateful for everything that happened. But it could have gone wrong as well. You know, the career depends on many factors, especially when you're an athlete. And also because of the proximity to the university in Kempton, I decided to do this second path. And I'm not a young sportsman, a young athlete anymore, but I've not reached the end of my career. But my, the contacts I have, the contacts, the people that I got to know in sports during sp my sports career and also during my course of study helped me a lot. And I'm looking forward to what comes after my sports career. Well, I don't, I'm not pessimistic. So what was your best sports moment? Because you've quite a lot of medals. Is there anything special, something special? Well, I think this one moment does not exist. I live for the successes, of course, and the achievements. And in 2017, when I became World Cup winner four times in a row when I had the perfect day on the jump, on the ski jump. No, 
then I was able to enjoy the triumph, right? But Olympic races as well, you know, they're also amazing. But it's also moments during your training, the hard work you put in. I love to train, I love to develop myself further, I love to fine-tune everything with regards to ski jumping and cross-country skiing. Of course, those individual moments, they probably shine brighter than the smaller things, but I live for training as well. Well, very good transition, I think. Today it's about technology and technique, and technique is technology is important in sports, winter sports, no matter whether it's the bindings on your skis whatsoever. But independent from that, there is also something with a cooperation with the automotive industry, so you're also in the wind channel. What is your CW value, basically? Well, I found out that the CW value, of course, is important important for your starting position, for your position that you have on the jump before you jump off the ski jump. Well, of course, you find the CW value where it becomes hard for your technique that is applied. So those technological opportunities you have, wind channel or something like that, that was made possible by Audi. We went to the wind channel f to Stockholm this year where we had this wind suit where you get very, very close to different positions where you can do tests that you usually can't do because a G scump is very um, difficult because usually you can only do s 6 to 12 jumps a day because it's very exhausting, no matter whether it's physically or mentally. And you have this wind channel in Stockholm that had a slope comparable to a ski jump where we could test materials of skis, shoes, how do I have to position and control my body. So it needs to be an interplay of values that you can measure, that you can evaluate, also using sensors on your skis. So what is the right angle, the right angle when you are in the air. Those are things you can inc include, but it is not basically the important factor because ski jump, ski jump is a dynamic system that includes your body and your body basically feels different when you do ski jumping or cross-country skiing so it's sort of a simulation and it helps and this experience needs to be incorporated in the entire training well, simulation, this is something which will, which you will be facing in a second. I would like to ask all the keynote speakers to the stage, Professor Dr. Hauke, Sascha Semmler, Bernhard Schick as well, could you please come to the stage for a second? I hope we manage to find a way with the microphones. We also want to have a look at the driving well, expertise of Johannes. We will have a look at you driving in the simulator, whether it is as good as on the ski jump. Uh, I think I won't become a race driver, but I think I can drive a car. Well, there are some race drivers that become influencers, so who knows. So what was the plan? So can someone just pick him up, get him to the uh, simulator. Yeah, we will see it live in a second as well, and I think we can use the time to have a short discussion. Xaver, you can also come to the stage if you want to. Yeah, sure, sure. Probably there are some questions to you, so it will take some time until Johannes is in the simulator, and we also see a live stream. Here you can see, just the way he seats himself. Let's use the, se the time for a important topic. How important is this close cooperation between research and industry? Is it a question for me? Yes. Well, for us, as the University of Applied Science, you know, it, you can see it in the name, right? It is very important to have the interface and to serve this interface. And I think I said it before, it's a win-win situation, or it should be a win situation, 
for the university, i.e. for our students, for our scientific associates, and we have also been equipped with research equipment. So this is important for the transfer, for the technological transfer and the knowledge transfer. Mr. Semmler, what are the challenges for you and your company when it comes to the mega trend of automated driving? And where is the point where we can see an importance of the cooperation with the IFM. Every institute, every company has strengths. And if you manage to bundle or structure the topics that everyone can bring in the strengths, so for example, a proximity to a test circuit, you know, to have it at the doorstep, this is important. And if you bring the partners together in such a way that everyone can have a synergy, then you can be successful. So everyone should be able to bring in their strengths. Professor Hauke, the high-tech agenda Bavaria. How is this agenda realized by the university? Well, the high-tech agenda per se is a very important program, not only for the University of Applied Science, but also for universities to get a better position in the areas of AI, for example. I also talked to presidents with other German federal states, and some were quite... Um, um, envious, basically, because now it is the first time that we received resources for the applied science. And before that, we had to manage it ourselves by intrinsic motivation and try to find funds ourselves. And thanks to the high-tech agenda, we were enabled to position our work differently. So there are different points of so this promotion right. So we want to have quality and we want to show the quality that we have. We are on a very good track and this was enabled by the high-tech agenda and the plus. Mr. Fackler, what do you think about the fact that, what do you think about what has happened to the area that you flew over? So a lot has happened, right? So what do you think when you look at the Algoi Valley or what did you say, Silicon Hill? So is that close to your vision? You know, when you want to succeed in this fight, you always have to be one step ahead. Well, I know what happens on the market, right? The origin was we wanted to have a noise test center, basically, because the guidelines changed and the capacities of the TIF changed. So I knew this will be big business. So the first thing I built was a noise measuring area. But then, of course, everything just one thing came to another and everything developed and everything was and is future. You can't plan everything. Of course, you have to take risks because otherwise it won't work. And this was basically the starting point of the industry coming in as well. And this is how the test center developed. Well, I think Johannes Ritze can drive risk-free, can he? Can't he? Yeah, I think he may have some issues until everything is in operation. So Johannes is, you know, moving a bit. Well, the situation is that I don't have, you know, big lobbies behind me. I'm a private person, basically, and I'm a Algoi person saying what I don't have is what I don't want to need. Uh, what, I, what I don't have is what I don't do. 
So continental, basically, they have a different mindset. They say, oh, I build everything, and then they do it, and I'm a different type of person. Okay, now he's driving, isn't he? Yes. Johannes is driving in Paris. Well, virtually. Fully digitized streets. I told you that it's fully scanned, and it's the part of the Formula E racetrack where the Formula E races take place. And it is a partial area. You see the way he moves. You see many different types of roads, and I hope he turns right in a second. I hope he turns right. <laughs> yes, and he will be driving on a bumpy road, bumpy stones. You see it in the background noises. So I think they will switch to a different camera. You don't see it very well in this live stream, but basically it's a bumpy road, different stones, and you also see that we can change the characteristics, comfort characteristics of the car and evaluate them differently. Oh, this bumpy road could be simulated in the lower Algo region, right? <laughs> yeah, but not on the uh, roads outside of cities. Well, of course, what we can do as well, we can include traffic as well, but we don't want to overstrain Johannes right away. And we can also make passengers jump onto the streets. But as you can see, we have different asphalt types. And of course, we want to find out, okay, what can be um, op offset by the axles, by the wheels, or tires. What can be done with active um, suspension, etc.? So, in the Algo region, we don't have cities similar to Paris. I think some of you may also convince yourselves of the characteristics. And to drive this track, basically, is what you can experience yourself. Ah, okay. So can you talk to us? Yes. So what is it like to drive in Paris? Well, it's well strange, but it is fun. You know, having the different bumps and the movements, you know, it's quite strange, but well, basically from motorsports games, you're used to it, basically. But, the th you know, the movements the car does leads to totally different dimension of experience. But it is fun. <laughs> and also the modeling of the tire is not that easy, because I know it from my own experience. Ah, you were in Darmstadt, right? Yes, it's something great that you made, it because driving dynamics, then the tire, you know, the, the chemicals and the magic, actually, that is in a tire to integrated into the simulation. It's just amazing. Yes, it was a huge step. It was a leap of faith to get a highly physical um, 3D model thanks to uh, our partner as well. So you don't manage to do it yourself. If you don't have a a programmer or a software developer of a simulation software, it is almost not possible. And only by having a competent partner, it is possible. So we still, of course, have a long path ahead, but it's a very exciting topic that we have here. So topic ESP adjustment, this is something that we will be working on in a second, to have an ESP adjustment in the simulator. So, you know, that we have a very high yeah. maturity degree when we go to the real car, yeah, to the real vehicle. Yeah, you can drive yourself if you want to. Good. Oops. I don't know what that was, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that was probably <laughs> some <laughs> kind <laughs> of um, <laughs> curve. <laughs> <laughs> the rim is probably <laughs> broken <laughs> now. It could also be that uh, your <laughs> tire bursts completely <laughs> when you <laughs> race over the <laughs> curb. <laughs> you can also change uh, tire pressure. <laughs> Different tire pressures <laughs> can be set. <laughs> so all that is possible. Great. 
Then so eine kleine Pause uh, should we take a small sagen, break? Pause, I would also say a small break. Um, I think everybody Appetit. is a bit thirsty uh, and a bit hungry. Then I would say we could take the break right now and yeah, also, uh, yeah taking this occasion we could also, yeah, I think uh, Rappenglitz as the next driver, you wenn, are cordially invited haben, if you have a race gut, circuit, a race track, that would be great because at highest <laughs> speed I would give uh, the application for one. consolidation genau, to him then. But yeah, you can go um, next um, in the break. Um, we are ready uh, for you, so to speak. You can tell us where you want to drive, whether you want to drive in Paris. We would also have the Nuremberg circuit, Nürburgring. But um, I think when you when you drive that for the first time, Nürburgring, that's uh, definitely challenging. But let us know. Do let us know where you want to drive. Okay. Then uh, the buffet is open. Thank you very much. And we'll meet again at um, 5.15 p.m. with the first panel discussion on the topic of why do we need virtualization. So make use of the break for the exhibition. There will also be guided tours. So go into the other levels as well. There's also drinks and refreshments uh, provided there. And I think um, in the discussion, you will also come up with new ideas. So it remains to us to say thank you for the first session and see you later. So, shall we ask our guests to the stage just at this point yes I think yeah, well, then we can have a seat so I would like to ask Dr. Thomas Kersten and Dr. Florian Goy to come to the stage yes just please have a seat in the center everyone just one microphone please so we have Okay, genau, great. Haben wir noch den so then we also have Gerald Hoffmann, Gerald Hoffmann von, uh, Kosin, right, Kosin, who will basically be here live from the simulator. Probably um, he may so come out. So he is basically live and he is supposed to be included. So I think you can see it behind me on the screen. Yeah, yeah we hope not to forget him, basically. Yeah. Um, right, um, ladies and gentlemen, so before everyone is back, so um, let's start slowly. So, so I would like to welcome you here to panel discussion. One, the topic I want to talk about is virtualization. Why do we need virtualization and what are the benefits and challenges of it? And I have here on stage Bernard Schick, everyone knows it, um, well known Thomas basically, Dr. then Dr. Thomas Kersten from Volkswagen Dobrasil, yeah, I think you always have to and add Florian that, right? yes, and Florian Greuf from the Hyundai Motor yeah. Europe Hello. Technical Center, a warm welcome. Genau. Um, yes. Moment, ich mich uh, meine, wait, meine I gekriegt, das macht aber confused my cards, but... Luckily, they are numbered. Okay, that's the right sequence. So I know that I don't talk with Mr. Hoffman, but with Mr. Kersten, this is what I could memorize myself. Dr. Kersten, you've been working in chassis and vehicle dynamics development at Volkswagen for many years, and you've helped shape virtual developments there. Virtualization is a big, big word, so you can basically imagine many, many things when you hear that. But what does it mean in your area, and what do you expect from it? But basically, um, it is about the following. So to ja, simulate the car, no, in chassis calculation or chassis simulation, it's physical characteristics, so driving dynamics, driving comfort, but also firmness. So we always differentiate between function, dynamics and driving, com uh, driving comfort, and stiffness and firmness. The second part of the question, what do we actually expect from it? Well, it is all about getting exact statements and data at an early stage of the development. So with that, we basically transfer things to a different stage. We are faster at the end of the day. And of course, it's all about replacing hardware tests and having virtual tests, so simulations in order to be faster and more cost efficient. Because at the end of the day, prototypes cost a lot of money, and also the calculation, the simulation costs money, 
but compared to the prototype costs, is lower. Okay, and it could be reproduced under different circumstances. Yes, def def definitely. You always have to have a model. So you have to copy reality. So you have to validate a model. Then you have to have measurements. So you can only use simulation mean in a meaningful way when you have a comparison to reality. And therefore, you need measurements. And if this model is validated, you have a starting point. And then you can say you can use this validated model to continue to work and work virtually. Well, Mr. Dr. Goy, you've also been doing simulation and chassis development for many years. What gaps do exist still today, or when will we be able to develop a vehicle completely on the computer? Will that even be possible at some point? Well, yes. First of all, I think virtualization is everywhere. So we see it in the audience, we see it in the discussion. First of all, I don't want to talk about the gaps, I want to talk about what we can do already. It's not a few, and Dr. Kasten mentioned it already. There is an incredibly big tool set of simulation tools, simulation methods, software, ranging from functional models that can run in real time, basically, also via tools just like the driving simulator that what we can see in the back here. There are also tools that make it possible to have multiple body systems to be simulated. And of course, what we will also see highly complex vehicle models that can be simulated. So basically, we have many tools at hand that enable to simulate handling, driving comfort, and so on and so forth. And to get to your question, where are the gaps? I think there are two aspects. So one aspect is what I think, that you have to use it continuously in the development process. Most of you may know it from software development. They always or often talk about continuous integration, deployment, etc. And I think in the vehicle development process, in the simulation, this is what we want to achieve. So we have to create data platforms that enable us to become more efficient when it comes to model setup, model validation, so that the person that needs to validate a model has these tools. The second aspect refers to the holistic simulation of the vehicle. That means, nowadays, we often work, and this is just according to my experience, we work in silos or in the different expertise um, settings, so chassis, chassis, regulation systems, etc. But if you want to understand a vehicle holistically, and this is what we want to achieve with a simulator, then the models need to be able to depict other characteristics, just like dynamics um, in longitudinal, longitudinal dynamics. So if you want to depict that, you want need to have a model that is able to have the longitudinal dynamics, right? So those are aspects that are necessary in order to, for once, increase efficiency in the development process or in the simulation process, and in order to be able to make it successful at the end of the day. Dr. Kersten, are we really moving fast enough here when it comes to this topic and what is preventing us today from doing much more virtually? So, obviously, there is, you know, an obstacle. Well, are we too slow or not fast enough? Well, of course, we always wish to be faster. But on the other hand, we also have to be realistic, which means we need to have a specific confidence level for simulations. And it costs time to set up models and validate them. Of course, we've become better, better computer performance, etc. 
but that costs time. And if I think about my career at Volkswagen, when I started as a calculator, the way of calculations I conducted took three weeks. When I changed my job five years later, went to the production direction, such calculations were done within a few hours. And of course, we've become faster in this point. Of course, the company always wants to be faster. That's clear. And I think there is a lot of potential still waiting there, but I'm sure we are on a good track. So let's include Mr. Hofmann from the simulator. Although it's not allowed to talk to the driver, because, well, this was the case in my school bus, but let me ask you, Mr. Hoffman, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right, and it's absolutely fine, because usually on the Nürburgring, Nürburgring circuit, you don't actually have um, panel discussions. Oh, I see the first problems occur. No, I'm on a digital twin of the northern loop. Well, the track actually is known as Green Hell, and of course it describes the um, requirements of the track towards equipment and also people, and it is used from car manufacturers worldwide as a test circuit, as a test track. So what I ask myself, so we have the digital twin of the track, so what is applicable in real life is also applicable here. So the claim is that the test driver experiences everything such that all aspects can be evaluated. In an environment, though, which is basically independent, of course. Well, of course, there are some advantages. So without leaving the car, you can change setups or set up um, parameters. And, of course, you're not dependent on time and space, so you can also test tracks and circuits which you cannot basically test in real life. We also have a high detail level here, as you can see, and the effort is just immense in order to make this just real, realistic. The details that are hidden on the track starts with um, surface material. Because if you want to have detailed feedback from the surface, then you need to work very in a very detailed way. The northern loop here has a length of 21 kilometers, and the surface was calculated and measured in a size of one times one square centimeters. So we also have many, many calculations that take place on the surface of the wheel where you have the connection point to the street. Nowadays it's possible and it opens totally new paths and opportunities because the wish was just mentioned that you want to get away from different questions that can only be answered by, di by specific tools and you want to have a vehicle that can be used and evaluated by test drivers according to different questions, characteristics, you know, for example, driving over the curbs, what happens there. So you can also see here how the tire goes over this curb. Or you can also just get just general performance validations. Well, thank you, Mr. Hoffmann. Well, simulators have been around for a long time, Professor Schick. So can simulators close the gap and above all how? Well, if you virtualize the development process even more, and I talked about this before, the situation is that the engineer is be strange. Well, of course, at the end of the day, it's all about it's not about just getting great driving experiences, no, just to get to make the people buy them. So the simulation is not yet realistic. So what you can do is you can have rational and objective characteristics to be evaluated in the simulator. And the simulator makes this gap and fills this gap because you can make this driving experience experienceable and to have the claim we get 100 percent or we want to do everything on the simulator you know it is not possible because we only want to get specific feedback well the simulator becomes more and more an expert sim which means it is a tool for the experts in the past 
simulators were for testing studies and research and they were used as tools for researchers or for people in order to um, assess technology and people and it becomes more and more a tool to make progress and develop further vehicle development. And of course we have the development departments and they do simulations and then all of a sudden there are KPIs coming out and the question is are those KPIs good or not? And on the other hand, there are also test drivers that say they don't manage to get this entire test scope because they have such a short period of time. So we go to the vehicle with a low maturity degree and the question is, how can we get a maturity level before we have cars? You know, of course, we don't want to achieve 100%, but we want to increase the jump base, so to say, and being able to sort out different things. And this is the path where the simulator can close the specific gap. Okay, so it was about simulating human being and the interaction. Now it's about the fact that simulation is used as a tool for development. So what are probably Dr. Kersten key applications from your point of view where you expect a high benefit? What do you think? What could it be? Well, first and foremost, it's topics I always get feedback and need feedback from the driver. For example, it could be a tire adjustment. So if you have a tire adjuster that is working on the test track, just as Bernard said it, you know, in order to sort out specific tires, the simulator can help us in this respect. Because then later, you just need to test a few tires on the real vehicle. Well, of course, you don't replace anyone or anything, but the profile is much more be better. And also when it comes to steering adjustments, this is also possible. So where you need to have um, transfers dynamic, there we have a good usage. But also when it comes to the axles, for example. So when it's about to um, simulate axle default or something like that. We have a promotion basically with the so-called Dr. Wanten. He has a um, thesis about axle failure. So you can basically have to design a fail-safe design, right? So there are many opportunities in the area of functional development when it comes to steering and tires. But there are also many areas of application when it comes to field safe. Mr. Hofmann, you develop and market very detailed and physical F-tire tire models. What motivates you to bring the F-tire model to driving simulator and what was the biggest challenge? Well, the element, the results, the impact of the tire, they can be felt everywhere in the car. So drivability, etc. And of course, it is feasible that a complex tire model, which is not only designed for a specific purpose, but copies the real-life tire and making it a universal tool, this is very good. Well, the usage basically is for the development of universal models that are and can be used from a driving dynamics uh, or um, another institute. Okay, now we don't hear anything. Can you? No, no, it's not a sound issue. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, again. Uh, so where was I? <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Universal models. Universal models are used and they do not only serve specific questions. And this is what we expect from a real vehicle. So it can be observed from different points of view, different aspects. Well, something is not right. Well, basically, 
Stell mal die This Reine should not have happened. Ich kann so lange wie ja im realen Leben, ne? Das ist jetzt Probably it's better not to talk to, <laughs> to the driver. But just in real life, right? You can't <laughs> multitask, basically. Well, that has not happened before. That has not happened. Okay, so let's continue with you, Mr. Goy. How do you see the potential for shifting comfort assessment to the simulator in the early development phase? Basically, we regard comfort assessment as very important. And even more important, it is to do it as early as possible. Because driving comfort is a characteristic in the vehicle that is influenced by components that need to be assessed and evaluated at an early stage. Of course, there are some components that can be changed at a later stage of the development. For example, stabilizers, software-based things just like steering adjustments or springs or something like that. But the structure of the car, the chassis, the stiffness, local stiffness, and so global stiffness, etc. Or also elastomer and bearings. So here we talk about a, diff a month-long process to design an elastomer bearing, for example, to design it, to test it, etc. Also when it comes to endurance. And for those components, we think a tool just like a driving simulator or this chain of software tools just like F-Tire by Cosin or a real-time multiple body um, simulator helps to answer it. Of course the consequence is that the models need to be up-qualified. So the models that we needed and used before and used them with regards to you know, handling assessment, etc. And those characteristics need to be integrated and combined. And this is an additional challenge. But if you manage this challenge, it is really helpful for driving comfort. Mr. Hofmann, are you there? Well, you're rolling backwards. I wanted to add, basically, what possibilities there are. So the boundaries between those um, areas of application, they become more blurry. So the assessment criteria for driving dynamics, they also meld together and they're blurring and merging with real life, basically. Well, in real life, we don't always drive on ideal surfaces. So that means for having assistance systems in real life, it is also good to test what happens if it is disturbed in the process. I think it is not tested virtually, and I think in a driving simulator it becomes possible. So that systems which are, st which are still prototypes or only virtually available can be observed in a quite objective way. And I think this could help correcting things at an early stage. Well, Bernhard Schick, that all sounds more like conventional vehicles. So what can be done with automated driving and what synergies do exist? Well, the situation is that the actorix is not the topical, just like driving, strain, brake, etc. So that means eventually the situation is that the assistance, driving assistance, um, need to be adjusted before or require adjusted systems before. So if you have a lane assist, it is dependent on a specific level of maturity of the steering. And of course, it would be great that you have specific vehicle prototypes so the steering guy can start and the person responsible for the lane assist needs to wait until the steering guy actually has produced a specific maturity of the system. So what, what does it mean with regards to continuation? Of course, it could be the case that there is a certain maturity in the simulator 
and after that, you know, there's a higher handshake, then you may have some overpressure tests and so on and so forth. Then you have hard, soft, early, late disturbance, etc. So different tracks, different curves also can be adjusted. And the basic function can be adjusted. But this person is dependent on a specific level of maturity of the steering wheel, right? Of the steering, because otherwise the, um, the adjustment guy needs to, uh, is just going in circles. So, what needs to be done is you always have to have a basis where you can build up on. So one topic, lane assist. So it is thinkable. We identified it as a scenario. We will work on that together with Conti and Audi. So we build up a virtual control unit that can then be depicted in a simulator. But a second topic, second topic is comfort. So we conducted a study where we asked the question, what driving comfort is needed in an automated car? If the people do, for example, side tasks, so if they do not just um, check the the street when they drive, but probably, you know, doing something, um, working on the tablet, on the phone or something like that. So, those are great, great topics that you can depict basically in a driving simulator, because you can also conduct real uh, street measurements, and you can also import different measurements and different KPIs, and you can actually play with the gains just put it up and down and then you can also find out where the limits are or where are the thresholds when the patient says, say, ah, I don't want to watch a movie anymore. And of course we can answer the question with models. Ask, okay, how much chassis do we need? Do we need a lean into curve function? Is it feasible at all? And those questions and issues are very difficult to answer in a test drive, right? So you see that bridge is there right away. Then, of course, there are also other factors, just like traffic, etc. But we found out at an early stage that we need to know the basics first. And when driving dynamics is set, then you just and go um, up one level after the other. Another topic is controllability. We have made some um, publications together with Volkswagen, and basically it doesn't matter whether it's a default or a failure of the axle or a mechanical default. The question is, does the driver or the passenger realize and recognize that there is an error or a default? And if the driver recognizes that there is an error, is the vehicle safe to be controlled? And this is the question we, and an issue we have with regards to mechanics, but also with other areas. I think it's advisable to do our basics and then just try to progress one step after the other. So when it comes to lane assist, I can tell you from my own experience, there is a leeway to the car. So I think, think the car basically yeah, just yeah, yeah. puts <laughs> more <laughs> value <laughs> on <laughs> my maturity <laughs> level. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I just okay. switch it off regularly. <laughs> yeah, we can <laughs> ask <laughs> the manufacturer. <laughs> what <laughs> manufacturer <laughs> do you have? <laughs> well, it's a Fiat. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a Fiat. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it's brand new. I'm poor. I'm happy that it's not a Volkswagen. Lucky yeah, me. Vielleicht, um, eine letzte Frage an die well, Runde. probably a last question Ida, to Ida the Ida round. Eingeladen, was dazu so everyone, of course, um, is invited to make a statement there. The biggest potential today Wo sehen Sie das in automotive development, where do you vorstellen? think, where is it, and how could Gibt's this great world of the future be or, or look like? Noch, or do, do the problems spricht. come if you talk about a great Frage, world? Well, the question is, what do you uh, think, think a great world is? Is it yeah, land yeah, level 5 automatic yeah, driving? Well, my ideal <laughs> world would be if the lane <laughs> assist works <laughs> properly. I don't know what level it is, but I think it should work, shouldn't it? No, it's not level 5, is it? No. I think we will never reach that because the industry and technology, they always develop further. They develop further. As soon as we have reached a specific level where we think it's the ideal world, then 
we will have different wishes. Bernard Schick started the discussion, motion sickness, for example. What, as a driver, what influence do I have? And there may be some questions and issues we can't think of today. So I believe, or I think, there is no ideal world in the next 10 to 15 years. Okay, what about you? Also ich stimme grundsätzlich zu. Well, I agree generally. <laughs> Wobei ich der Heilbild schon ein Stück weit optimistisch. Well, I'm quite optimistic um, and look forward to this ideal world in an optimistic way. Let me just tell you um, something from my experience. Die the virtualization die that we are um, conducting is what we do together with the specialists of simulation technology. And what we found out with regards to getting the virtual world into the vehicles is that we need awareness. And this needs to take place through every company. Everyone needs to be involved. Well, we are with Hyundai in Rüsselsheim, we are only a small development center with just a few hundred people. And in Korea, we have several thousand developers. I think it's just similar to Volkswagen in Wolfsburg. And to create the awareness that we go into this direction, that we have to take virtualization seriously, that we have to integrate it in order to be able to benefit from the advantages that you mentioned, efficiency increase in the process. This is what we have to work on. And to get those few hundred people on board is difficult. You need to have many discussions. We have founded, or we founded panels to talk about these topics, just cross-department panels. Yes, you have to show successes, small successes, achievements. Yes, I think everyone needs to be on board so that an ideal world can be created in the development department. Let me just comment on, one, on that. Whenever you've reached a specific level, there will always be a new target. And this is normal, because otherwise you will not be able to reach a specific de development stage. And this is also progress. Well, thank you very much for this round. It was just amazing. Thank you very much. And it was a lot Wir of fun. Sehen uns hier, so um, we um see each other halb neun, at 8.30, so 8.40, 8 so there will be a second discussion round. But now, let yeah, me just genau. stand up. Yes, we will start now with tours. the guided tours. Weiß, tours. I don't know, Jonas, where are you? Can you just come to the front? We have guided tours. You all have, or you should, have a small little dot on your name plate. Oh, I don't have one. Uh, have three so tours. that means we have three tours. At the beginning, when we started, when you did the registration, you were able to decide for one. No, no, there are three tours, and you decided for one. So that means the button, the, the dot you have, Genau, wir haben es hier an den, uh, auf dem auch dargestellt. So ah, okay. we actually die, showed it here on the thing. So the topic research starts at the Audi Q5, uh, Q7 outside. Topic technology start at Barco stand. Test efficiency at the Hyundai e i30. Well, we have great exhibitors here in the building. And if you don't want to take part in the tours, just go upstairs and talk to the exhibitors. Yes, so there will be a pitch, a short pitch, at every stand. I don't know how many stations you have. Well, it depends. There are 10, roughly. And yes, there is a short, a brief pitch by every exhibitor. So five minutes, they will explain what can be expected at the exhibition and what you can see. And then you can continue so that you get an overview of the exhibitors that you can also talk with them later on. Good. Dann vielen Dank. Vielen Great. Spaß. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoyed. Genau. And see you Dank later. Okay, Dank. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Jonas, please go ahead. Ja, genau. <laughs>
Ja, da sind wir wieder. Well, we are um, back again. Sich nachher, um, ich glaube, so probably, die zwei I think well, sich those two microphones need to be shared between four people. I think it's okay. Das wird hinhauen. But yeah, um, yeah, I think panel it'll work. Discussion panel zwei. discussion number Wie two. Werden wir in der so how und effizienter do we become more effective and efficient um, in vehicle dazu, development? Ich jetzt, muss ich nur gucken, and, ist die well, let me just get the right sequence. Um, so here with me, I have da, Markus Seinreuter from Audi. Oh, I'm sorry, Continental, that is. Uh, then we have Jan Münchhoff from Audi. Then we also have Martin Elf from IPG Automotive, Christian Schallmeier from Automotive, Continental, and as co-moderator, Professor Peter Pfeffer from M Dynamics. I think he have to put his microphone on. No, I just hold it like this, because the cable is too short. <laughs> Ja, ähm, es okay, geht also, wir so reden äh, über automatisiertes Auto, Moti, nee, automatisiertes Auto, Fahren, Auto, no, wait. Automated Driving, Electric Mobility, so Digitization, von denen, äh, those are mega trends auch. that are talked ähm, about a lot, right? So, da, äh, so the automotive industry of course needs to äh, face und and stand in a quite challenging field. Ähm, Everyone is looking for the best solution and the complex technology, the more and more and the bigger variants and vehicles need to be developed in a shorter period of time. And how do we manage this? This is the question. And how do we become more effective and efficient in vehicle development? This is what we're going to talk about. So I would like to ask a question in general round. Just feel free to answer. First. Where do you see the greatest challenges in vehicle development today in those changing times? Is there a point where you say this is important, a challenge, yeah, whoever. I, I okay, let me start. So from the point of view from Continental when it comes to driving assistance systems, I think the challenges go towards highly automated driving, and this is of course known in this round here. The number of use cases will just skyrocket. You can see today with the emergency brake assistant, which will be demanded and required by law just in the near future. So the number of technology in the vehicle has been just um, doubled and uh, multiplied. So the tests to have them, to get them from the car, the vehicle, into the simulator, this will be a challenge. And this will be the challenge of the future, so with regards to driving assistance systems. When it comes to development efficiency, so Mr. Minchov, you work with Audi. Which topics do you phase or where do you cooperate with the IFM as well? I deal with the topic of driving characteristics. So I always ask myself, what haptic impression do you have from the driving experience? So what haptic experience does the driver have? There is a high expectance expectation also when it comes to feeling well. And the higher the automation degree is, the more important it gets because you always get a connection between the environmental situation and how the vehicle moves. So the claim, the requirements are becoming higher and higher and we deal with the question how can in individual situations a haptic impression be guaranteed. Meaning, if you drive in an Audi, for example, for longer time, you always have to feel the same. So you have to say, that's an Audi, I feel that. And that's 200% Audi DNA. And this is the challenge, basically. So my colleague just mentioned it, the complexity of the vehicles, of the systems, of the functions that we offer is just the biggest challenge. Okay, so the driving correct or very important is what you say. And how does that influence efficiency and efficacy? Well, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to say, I have or I manage one driving characteristics despite having different body forms, systems, probably also different driving characteristics. And to get that included, with the 
um, the complexity of the street. This is a challenge, and we need to be much more efficient. We need to work a lot with models. We need to reach a very high level of maturity in the virtual vehicle already, because the development time and the opportunities we have are just too low and not enough. And I think efficiency is not reached by more testing in the vehicle, but probably by testing virtually, modularly as well. I think I took some questions of you, but let's just go back and forth. Yeah, I want to ask more about that. So which driving characteristics are important for driver assistance system that they make a difference? Well, with automated driving, when we talk about this point, it is steering and also uh, the chassis or the, the springs, uh, the suspension, I mean, and because this is where you get direct feedback. And a lot of development work and know-how is invested in this area. So we started with getting driving characteristics as DNA, and of course we have vertical dynamics, longitudinal, diagonal dynamics, etc. So it's very interesting to design a, a specific dynamics in the car because the limits are different. And now we have reached a point where we basically cannot include everything. So what we have now is we have a situation we need to design a behavior because the machine is so performant and this is something what the client basically experiences right away and the customer feedback is also very important. Okay, where are the biggest deficits? Where do you see the greatest potential in terms of methods and tools basically? So where are the customers not satisfied? The challenge is that it's not unified or standardized globally. So a global adjustment, standardization, is meaningful. So, for example, that you say you deliver a specific setup for every market that works for the customers. And this perfect interaction of longitudinal and cross-dynamics is the goal. So when the customer gets out of the car and says, this was a round thing, this was a good thing, you know, this is what we want to achieve. Audi does not only identify itself and define itself by performance only. Of course, we want to offer performance, but we are also used as a long-distance vehicle. If we have an RS7, for example, we have a car which is very sportive, but with that you can also drive from Hamburg to Vienna with only one or two refill, gas refill stops, and then you get out and then you say, okay, I have received and I have experienced a specific um, recovery feeling as well. Okay, let me just ask you, what tools are needed in order to achieve that? Well, what's just great for me is the opportunities that I discussed with Bernard, the opportunities that we have with the simulator, because the transfer, and it's, I think, a human factor, a human component, the transfer of our subjective developers that have just immense empiric knowledge towards the digital world is very important, and a driving simulator is very helpful as a tool in order to get this knowledge into an objective view. And I experienced it twice here, and I'm so um, thrilled by that, and this is something we, we are going to use much more often. Yeah. Well, Mr. Weinreuter, which, I'm, I'm sorry, how will it look like for level 3 plus systems? Are there more and more challenges that will be added? Well, of course, there will be more challenges when we have a level 3 system. The driver is taken out of responsibility, so the car needs to handle all situations, which increases complexity, of course. On the other hand, and you know, it fits just perfectly what you said because you asked before, where do the companies cooperate with, this, uh, with the Institute? We have the Metabi project where we try to find out where can we include and integrate um, the human being into the testing because a high complex driving system needs to drive the way a human being would drive. 
because you load with the ACC systems, well, sometimes, you know, it feels good, and sometimes it just feels as if, you know, the, break, the breaking phase took place just too early or too late. And we try to rebuild the process of the system such that the driver says, I feel safe and the, drive, uh, and the car drives in such a way that I would drive. Okay, so you say you need trust. Yes, of course, trust. Well, everybody enters a plane because they think it gets me from A to B. Yes, and I also trust my brakes, right? And they just do something because I push the brakes, right? Of course, something can go wrong, but you have to trust. And what role? Oh, what is important for driving simulators? And how do you see the interconnection between a simulation and a driving test? Well, I think the role of the simulation is undoubted. I also said it and we discussed about it. We'll test everything in the car, impossible, way too expensive, way too late, way too much effort involved, reproductionability questionable. I can't test worldwide and if only with a lot of effort involved. So whatever I can cover with a simulation at an early stage, it could be a software in a loop simulation that requires validated models, so vehicle models, but also sensor models, which is a challenge, in particular for us when we have a look at from the point of view from the sensors. So it's very difficult to get an ideal behavior, to depict the ideal behavior between camera and sensors. And then there are sometimes unwanted effects, that a radar sensor thinks there is an object, which is not an object, basically, and to Depict that is very, very difficult. And then we, as suppliers, when we say, okay, we want to have a validated driving or vehicle mo model, this needs to come from an OEM. So we need to have a very close cooperation there, because otherwise nothing can be depicted in the supply chain. Let me add something. You mentioned trust. Of course, when we talk about trust, tests are also part of it. No matter whether it's from the part of the automotive manufacturers, but also the suppliers. And it's important to guarantee trust with the products and that the products are safe. And I think there are many opportunities and the interconnection between different tools, no matter whether it's driving simulators, simulations, but also real tests, to ensure the right possibilities. This is important. Sometimes you can't say, okay, I do it here, I do it there, and then we do it on a simulator. But you have to have good opportunities to make to ensure a transfer from simulated to real life and vice versa. Okay, how do you get hold of this problem then? What needs to happen? if this interconnection is necessary? Well, it depends, of course, on the areas of application. We have some topics where we use statistic processes or where we are able to recalculate or make different test models comparable to each other. And as I said, it depends on the individual area of application or application per se. Because it's a difference whether I have an emergency break or something else. Okay, let me make a follow-up. Mr. Weinreuter is also um, responsible for that. Do you see some <laughs> opportunities? Well, I think you asked the wrong person. I am rather a sensor person. So driving simulators is a bit difficult because the environmental effects are the exciting ones. And driving simulators, they have some weaknesses with regards to environmental issues. Well, of course, we need to do some rework, but when it comes to assistant systems and autonomous function, the quality of the sensor output is of utmost central importance. Okay, so this is the homework for the IFM to work on. Yeah, we would love to support. What role does digitization then play in general when it comes to the automation of the test processes? Digitization and automation is very important in order to show efficiency and efficacy. Tests is efficient and 
good when it's fast. Well, to fail fast is basically something that every test department you know, needs to have because we don't want to wait for weeks until we get a test result. This is just a catastrophe. So automation is everything which is repeating, recurring, and simple. So this is something you have to obey when you know, trying to ja, push forward automation. Fahren, es kommt immer when it comes to automated driving, you always have a megatrend, so the media love to pick up that term as well. But when it comes to R&D, it's also a megatrend, I think. Um, um, Bis zur erfolgreichen Einführung gibt es so natürlich eine until we have a Testaufwänden, die da auf uns zukommen. There is a huge avalanche of tests an that we will be facing and können. we will probably not Herr be Elbs, able to manage all that. Die wir what test efforts are there that we hardly can cover um, today? Ich, ich überlegt, Very good question, um, basically. Wie testen wir denn, so I uh, try to ask myself, how do we test um, the human und, driver? Uh, and it's interesting when you deal with this question. Well, no, we didn't calculate how million kilometers do we have to drive, uh, do we have to, uh, someone to drive. Right, so we included abstraction. And I think it's important that this feeling is created that we also get this feeling with the machines, the machines that drive cars. Well, um, Where that may is lead is something we don't know. But an important Simulator point is that we work on it, and simulation is the only way we can also do it. Elon Musk can well, of course, I can't. Can. Well, Elon Musk can just you know, sinnvoll, throw um, it to the crowd. Uh, die, die but it is not meaningful to test it just in the free, um, in the wild, so to say. With simulations, we are able to get millions or billions of kilometers and learn what is important, what are the situations where I need to double check what does the automated driver do in this respect and those are the situations I test over and over again and of course then I also can leave some other situations out okay where are we with regards to level one or two system and what are we going to face with level three plus well, technologically we are when it comes to level one and level two systems we are able to make many parts of approval with regards to automation. But when it comes to level three, we are far away from that. The automotive developers, they are strongly focused on the fact that I need to experience it in the real sense, in the real meaning of a sense. So what we see here is just fantastic because the students learn that simulation opens up totally new opportunities. Well, of course, you have a test track here, but you don't always have to make the effort. In a simulation, you can realize your creativity much faster and well, much more extreme. So the students that are trained here they will also die know die it for level three. Okay, where are the big problem, the problem, the problem, problem fields and barriers? Is it the number of variants, objects, objects uh, kilometers, ranges, data, load? Yeah, I think it's the different variations. The different variations of software builds. Well, we always talk about continuous software development, right? Over-the-air updates always new um, builds um, and software versions. And then, of course, I have to think as well, do I have a different shifting gear for my RS7 or not? So those different variations, different test cases, so just a huge load of data is generated. And dealing with data is something we need to learn. But let's be honest, if we have a look at computer technology today, the tools are there, 
We just need to approach this step by step. So the methods that need to be established, so data science, shadow mode, AI, etc. Is that part of it? Well, definitely. Shadow mode, for example. Well, those are in just exciting topics where you have interconnections between real driving and AI, which is just a great environment here. We have a great environment here to test it. Also AI. No. I think, though, that we all don't have a good feeling for it. A feeling for how technologies may amend each other, supplement each other. If I use a driver, an AI driver, and use AI for testing, then I fear that human intelligence doesn't know what the two do together with each other. And we have a question to Mr. Meinreiter. So when it comes to automated driving, what role does the simulation play and what test tasks can be brought from the driving test drive or driving test to the simulation? So, so you mean, what do you get from the car in test environments? So what I have in my mind, I have simulation. And what we also use is hardware analog test benches. And they are perfectly suited to cover functional tests. So, for example, if the input signal gets into the control unit, this very output signal needs to get out. So this type of test can be automated perfectly. It can be done on a test bench. But I need the hardware for it, of course, the control unit. So I'm rather with a hardware, on a uh, hardware analog test bench. When it's only about software algorithms, I can have software in the loop, simulations, environments, and do some tests there. And I can try to find out, is the improvement that I aimed at, is it there already? So you can actually accelerate the development, and you can also get some different um, scenarios from the car into the simulator. OK, and how do you get a gearing, basically, an interconnection between the loop test benches and the test drive, the real test drive? That's a good question. Because it's, of course, a mindset question. So let's say the colleagues that come from the software test environment, they have a harder time understanding the vehicle and vice versa. So what we try to understand is basically logical, because we try to bring those two worlds together and also when it comes to validation, we try to have a common understanding. Christian Schallmeier said it as well. There is not the only or one single test environment, which is true. Because the question is, where am I? in my test process. Do I have a car, a vehicle uh, available? Does the OEM say, well, the golden sample, you will never get it out of my test area. There are different um, components we need to consider. So we always try to bring all the things together, the different worlds. Well, one amendment, Peter, I think, so because you asked about the weaknesses, I think we have problems with the model qualities. It doesn't matter whether it's driver models, vehicle models, and so on and so forth, so I can just go through the list from A to C. And the reason for that is probably, well, that one company can do better or not, but the reason is that the data which is generated, the load of data, that is generated is misused basically. So the data basically that is generated in the customer process and in our process, we could read out a lot if we did it right. And I think this is the key for the future, that we get this loop started. Okay, everyone for him or herself and everyone together. So that we make sure to work on the tools and get into automation, so automated, automated creation of software builds, automated improvement of models, etc. And I think this is key figures and key points to interconnect simulation and real test drive.
with Vielen each other. Für die, für die Runde, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great um, round, for the insights that I, as a lay person, understand um, more and more. Yeah. And I also get to know, or let's say, I get an understanding of where does the journey go, how far are we, and what is quite calming is that no matter how open you are for technology and the willingness, because what we heard before, development is never over. The good thing is that the fact of human being plays an important role, and I think many people do not know that. Because they think you sit in the ivory tower, program things, and I think that the human being is so important, is playing such a big role in the development of something great, and this is very soothing, basically, and calm What else do I take away with me is the following. Well, I hope that my... Genau, Lane so Assistant works better after the next update. Heute hat, this uh, has been basically genau. the red thread yes. through the entire event. May I ask Bernhard to the stage? Runde, so thank you, thank, 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 thank you very much for this round. Thanks for participating. Thank you, the audience, for listening and watching. So, he get one of those. Well, I think we can dissolve um, this round, an this an panel. Thank you very much for this exciting discussion. <laughs> we will continue tomorrow, <laughs> just for you to know. And we, are we haven't reached the end. Party. We have also a chill-out party, so you may stay for a while. Um, but before we end the official part, we would like to say goodbye to all of you. So thank you very much to you, the panelists. And I would like to ask my team onto the stage. So, yes, so I would like to ask the entire team to the stage so that you see who's behind all that. So we may move the chairs. Get some space for all the people. Well, there is one or two people missing here. wait until the movie is over, the film is over.
just in time. So I would like to thank you for your attention, for the great discussions, for the interesting evening. I think it was very relaxed, it was a great atmosphere. So Boris, thanks for the moderation, for being the host. So next time, it'll be you again. So it was fun. And last but not least, just for you that you see that there is a huge team behind, because I didn't have to do anything. It was all the ladies and gentlemen from the team. Thanks a lot to you. You did a great job. Now you see who's behind. It's a scientific employee. Yes. So everyone actually also just sweeps the floor. Doesn't matter whether it's a PhD person or just normal students. So tomorrow we will continue. Thank you ever so much. All right, so there's nothing more to say than just stay a bit. We have more to eat, more to drink, and I think outside is also something to eat. We also have some ice cream, I think. So let's have a relaxed evening. Tomorrow we will start at 9 a.m. So it'll be just a very intense day tomorrow. But I'd say let's just have a chat, relax, and then tomorrow we will continue. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.